Hi, everyone. This is America Adapts, the climate change podcast. Hey, Adapters. Welcome back to a very exciting episode. Joining me is Eric Rostin, the sustainability editor at Bloomberg News. In that role, Eric is part of the climate change team at Bloomberg. We have a jam-packed episode that covers everything from the fundamentals of climate journalism to the challenges for reporters in covering climate leaders like Greta Thunberg. We'll dive into the editorial process of newsrooms and how they decide what climate issues to focus on. With so many urgent issues vying for our attention, how do these newsrooms prioritize what to cover and what to leave out? You'll also hear the challenges for non-scientist reporters to make sure they're using the latest science in their stories. We'll also tackle the hot-button issue of climate modeling and whether it should be regulated. Some argue that climate models can't be ground truth by end users like local governments, while others say they are essential for understanding the future of our planet. We'll explore both sides of this debate and discuss what role journalists can play. And finally, we'll get inside the mind of a climate journalist. Eric in this case, and hear his insights and observations from the field. What drives him to cover this topic? How does he stay motivated in the face of so much bad news? Okay, upcoming episodes. I'm traveling to Trinidad and Tobago to record a podcast for the Keeping History Above Water Conference, where we will explore how this island nation is adapting its cultural resources to climate change. I'm also partnering with Forerunner, a company that helps communities prepare for the impacts of severe weather and adapt to future conditions. And also joining the pod is Mark Nevitt, a professor at Emory University, and we'll discuss some new work he's done on how climate change will disrupt the legal system. Great stuff on the way. Okay, let's join Eric Rostin from Bloomberg News and learn the fundamentals of climate journalism. Hey, Adapters. Welcome back to a very exciting episode. Joining me is Eric Rostin. Eric is an award-winning journalist who has spent more than 15 years covering climate change on topics ranging from science, technology, finance, business, and government. Since 2011, he has served as sustainability editor at Bloomberg News. Hi, Eric. Welcome to the show. Hi. Thanks for having me. I say this all the time. I love talking to journalists. It's always, it's just, I can kind of let my hair down a little bit too. It's not my typical guest on the show, but for people who aren't as familiar with Bloomberg News, can you tell them a little bit about that and just, I guess, more specifically the sustainability beat that you work on? Sure. Bloomberg News is a global news organization. We have 2,500 people around the world. It started out as an investor wire service 20 or 30 years ago, time flies. And in the last 10 or 15 years or so, it's really taken on also a general interest media bent. And we've tried a a few times over the years to launch a, a climate change project. And in 2020, we launched Green. And it is a has become a large, I think 20, can't remember, 20 or 20, 25 person team globally, and we just attack climate change from every angle, from science to business and economics, behavior, technology, you name it. we got a a great team here. We produce a lot of work every day, and won't you join us? Give us a brief history. I know this could be a really long story, but your own journey in journalism and how you, and you just described you're working on the Bloomberg team, but just your own climate journey when it comes to journalism. It's an accident, really. I... Got. I was at Time Magazine more than 20 years ago at this point, and I was in the business section. And I was trying to figure out what I should work on. I had spent a lot of the 90s in Russia doing various things, grad school, basically, and, and some research. And so when I got to Time, I just thought, well, Russia is sort of the only thing I have going for me, and energy is the only thing Russia has going for it. So I just started covering energy in the business section. And, and of course, that 2023, obviously, that origin story is taking a dark turn with events over there in the last year and year beyond. In covering energy, I, I saw we we weren't doing a lot of business stories on climate change, and it just kind of became my thing. You know, as a young journalist, you're just, you're looking for something to work on. And having thrown myself in, a few years went by, and I, I just found that I was bumping into climate change everywhere I, I turned. It eventually led to writing a book about the carbon atom. Literally, I went to the bookstore and thought, well, if I'm going to be doing this climate and energy stuff, I really I should just buy the book about the carbon atom and how it works and why it's behind everything. And it turned out nobody had written it. So I wrote it and I, I learned a ton and it really solidified this, this sort of climate journey I've been on. I just endlessly fascinating. It's everywhere you look. I can't look away. And it, you know, I'm just always curious to see what happens next. Yeah, it's one of those things that it just captures your imagination because it's this 
bigger, I mean, it's larger than life story. Yeah, I, I, I completely understand. You sent me a ton of articles that you've done. It, it was fantastic. I appreciate that. And you cover just a lot of diverse topics. And we're going to dig into a, a couple of those here. But I want your opinion. What climate story, and I guess in the past year, really captured your imagination? Now, it doesn't really have to be your favorite story that you wrote, but which one really stood out for you that kind of surprised you and really captured your imagination? I think the last year, it became clear toward the last part of the summer that the rains that were occurring in Pakistan were something historic. By, I think, the end of August or early September, it became a humanitarian disaster, you know, the likes of which happen, fortunately, rarely, but it did happen. And I was working on that, and there were a, a couple coincidences that were occurring. The annual climate talks, which did occur in November in Sharm el-Sheikh, Egypt, were around the corner. And even before the rains in, in Pakistan had begun, there has been a, a simmering conversation the last few years at the UN conferences about what the diplomats call loss and damage. And loss and damage is diplomatic jargon for the finance that developing countries need and deserve because they are at the receiving end of climate damages that were basically caused by the rich world. And the flooding was happening. That conversation was simmering. It just so happened that the head of the largest negotiating block of nations called the G77, the temporary head of that was Pakistan. And the meteorological event, the human tragedy that ensued, the upcoming talks all sort of conspired to put this loss and damage conversation on the map. At the same time, there was just enormous fighting against it from rich world countries. But over the course of like three or four months, the, the Pakistan tragedy and other factors conspired in the, the COP27 talks in Egypt to produce a diplomatic breakthrough on loss and damage. And I think looking back at 2022, when we talk about climate history, climate diplomacy, that development from zero to great progress on loss and damage is really going to be what we remember. Yeah, that's certainly, I mean, it got a lot of coverage, but I, I still don't feel, I mean, I, you know, obviously read a lot of climate coverage and never got this in America's mind how big that tragedy was. And even though I think a lot of journalists were trying to do their best, it was just the scale. You're not there seeing the flooding in front of your face. And so, yeah, that was pretty dramatic. So I want to go behind the scenes there at Bloomberg when it comes to climate coverage. Before I started the podcast, I was an environmental policy guy doing climate adaptation policy, natural resource sector, national park service. And so that's my background. And so now that I'm doing these stories around climate change, when I see the, you know, these big new, like Bloomberg, New York Times and Washington Post cover climate change. Oh, that's a great story. Oh, I would have done this differently. Why aren't they focusing on that? And so, you know, for my listeners going behind the scenes, climate change is this huge issue. How do you guys even pitch stories? How do you approach it? How do you kind of, there's a sense of responsibility, but a lot of news is very reactive, right? Something mm -hmm. happens and you cover it. So what is it when it comes to climate change? Can you give us a little bit behind the scenes on how you cover it? Here's one way of thinking about it is, and this is extremely mundane and not at all the answer you were looking for. Okay. But, uh, it's extremely difficult for me to like schedule meetings and lunches, you know, like professionally, like I get up in the morning and I have a pretty good handle on my day that doesn't really last more than a couple hours because either something happens or, you know, I have to edit something I've worked on, or there's not a lot of visibility and that makes it very exciting and it makes it, you know, never dull. But the reason that happens is because of exactly your question. There's so much going on. Climate change isn't really, you know, it's not a topic. It's a phenomenon that is descended on every sector of human activity. And we try to be comprehensive. We have a large team now, and we're I think everyone on the team has their own expertise, but we're also all constantly juggling different things. And we try to do our best. We try to stay not only current, but ahead of what's current. One thing that I think is atypical about this space is that while there always is 
reactive news, particularly as nations begin to articulate policy about it. And there's sort of like there's actually daily news cycle news about it. It's also very slow burning in a lot of ways. You know, the science is always there in the background. And so there's always slow developments in the background that we're always consumed with on top of the now, you know, sort of daily news cycle stuff. I'm not sure that's a great answer, but I agree with the premise of your question that it's a lot. I imagine even though you think there's this discipline, even in newsrooms, that I'm sure a lot of it's sausage making. And, you know, for a while there, and the guys at the Washington Post, and they have a newsletter that's relatively new, I don't know, six months to a year that they compile. And I would just get frustrated that it seemed like 80, 90% of the stories we're just all energy or carbon related. And, you know, obviously I'm an adaptation guy, resilience guy. And I even I wrote the woman who or, who like organized and she, she never responded to me, but it's just like, I'd, let's get some more. Because adaptation to me is this, this huge story. And I guess just pivoting a question for you is when in your newsroom, people that are in the climate change world, like practitioners, we kind of look at each other as, you know, there's the mitigation people, the carbon, and then there's the adaptation people. Everybody wants everybody to succeed. The mitigation people need to do what they're doing, but it's a different sector. It's a different discipline. When you're covering it as a news issue, do you guys see it as two separate issues or are you just thinking umbrella climate change? Because I, I would argue that might influence your coverage of it. We're all on the team. We're all aware, hyper aware of the classifications of mitigation and adaptation. And now loss and damage, you know, is another permanent part of the conversation. And just because the world categorizes it like that, as you said, but we don't write stories about adaptation. You know, we write about bridges and we write about real estate. And a lot of the trick in storytelling is to have an awareness of how professionals think about these things because we, we have to attack this problem in an organized manner. But we're also, you know, mostly writing stories about people and businesses and communities. And because of that, I think we just look for stories and, you know, news can take many forms, but I don't know that we're necessarily looking for an adaptation story. Like it's happening. Like we're, we, every week now we're doing adaptation stories, not because we're looking for adaptation stories, but because communities are being inundated or communities are building heat shelters or communities are buying air conditioning for the first time. So that I think is the lens. It's like a signpost, but not the actual road we're driving on. I will give you feedback during the episode, just my own opinion, that you can take it or toss it. And that people who are in the adaptation space really do, it's like this, we think it's a sector it's a, that merits its own narrative. And I think that if there's media coverage that looks at it that way too, that's very helpful because you think of national security, there's national security reporters and you could just argue, well, that's just an international story. No, it's a national security story because it's its own thing. And I just think as society would benefit if they really started getting their heads around this notion of adapting to climate change. It's its own thing. There's a lot of emerging professionals coming around it. So anyway, my feedback. No, I, thank you for that. And I, I think it's very helpful. And, and it, like I may even be making more of a superficial point is like, like I look for adaptation spending numbers, you know, and I read adaptation articles in peer reviewed journals. People aren't going to read about adaptation, right? You know, it's right. just, it's like a, it's almost just like a, what do you call it? You know, well, well, the thing that professionals and experts call adaptation, you know, people who just want to figure out why, what to pack their kids for summer camp, you know, that's less an adaptation story than a like, how are we going to live tomorrow story? And it's just that how do we live tomorrow stories are adaptation stories, if that makes sense. Yeah. And just a lot of people who are doing adaptation, resort, let's say local government folks, sometimes they don't even bring up the issue of climate change when they're integrating right. with the public. And I think it's a missed opportunity because this is going to be a decades long educational awareness building. And so they just don't want to create any trouble. But it's, these are these moments where you actually can help the public connect the dot with like, all right, you are preparing your kids for extreme. And that's my next question around extreme heat, but it's connecting those dots to climate change because maybe it'll create a bit more urgency around that bigger issue. And I mean, it's, I know it's tough to thread that needle, but there's opportunities there. It is. I mean, look at South Florida I and mean, the work that South Florida has been doing on climate change, often without mentioning climate change, is really quite interesting and uh, I think a real test case of, of, of what you're talking about. Yeah, I hate it. I'm from Florida and I, just, I think that's when I see that. <laughs> I just think it's terrible. That every And people don't realize, oh, we don't want to offend anybody, but they don't realize when you're not even mentioning on purpose, that's a form of condescension. You're just, you're, you're treating that end user as like, oh, well, they're not 
capable of dealing with it. And, I'll, and I'm also aware that you can't be naive about the audiences that you're talking to, but there's mundane ways to get this stuff out there. Okay, I'm going to pivot there. Okay, extreme heat. You've covered this a bit, but I actually didn't start covering it until probably two, three years ago. I just didn't do any episodes around it. And it's actually the number one killer, what, would, what you would associate with climate change and you know rising temperatures and such. How do you cover that issue? And when from a purely mortality point of view, it seems like it should get most of the coverage as opposed to like sea level rise. Well, this is a future threat. How do you guys kind of get your head around these impacts that are more urgent today? I think there's a slow game and a fast game. And the slow game is we do a lot of science coverage. So we always try to be up to speed on the latest analyses or projections of how fast the heat is going to come and where. And it, it, you know, the heat itself comes at a couple different speeds. Global temperatures everywhere have been rising, and it's sort of the, the primary fact of this whole conversation. But there's another speed that extreme heat is working on. And so every spring and summer, you know, it just starts up. Like uh, last year, it was Pakistan and India, where there was just extraordinary heat, and we just have to attend to it, you know, and we have to not only attend to it, but make sense of it within the body of scientific research that's been projecting this when it comes to adaptation, you know, the calls that have been made now for years for how cities can gird themselves uh, against this new heat and, you know, unfortunately, it's become, you know, it's never routine, but every year has a real rhythm to it when we know, you know, what stories we're going to be writing, you know, unfortunately, in the spring and summer. I think it's important to cover the temperatures within the overall context of the science. Um, there's just there's so much that we know. There's so much we've expected. And I, I just think it's important to explain what's happening today in the context of what we've been expecting for some time. And again, with news organizations being reactive with extreme heat, we find that it's mainly covered in the summer. And I don't know if he's on your radar, Dr. Lad Keith at University of Arizona. He's been on this podcast before, but he's just increasingly he gets quoted in, you know, the Washington Post and these big articles. And all summer long, it seems like once a week I'm seeing him quoted somewhere and he and I'll check in and we'll get a laugh out of it. But then come October, November, okay, no one's calling, no one's asking for a quote. Is it is there value just to cover when it's super hot out or is it just as a reaction to like, you know, the Northwest heat waves, but, or, I, you know, in the winter, maybe there could be some educational aspects to talking about it more. Oh yeah, absolutely. I think that I, I mean, winters are warming faster than summers. And I think in spring and fall, it's just harder to see. I mean, summer, it, it's just easiest because it's when people are most incapacitated by it. It's when the temperatures reach the highest levels. And I just like I never do this, but I did it the other day. People were talking in an elevator about, oh, it's so weird. There's no snow. I can't believe how warm it is today. And they just weren't making the connection. And so I just like butted into this conversation of strangers just because I sort of couldn't help myself and kindly, you know, hopefully pointed out that, you know, this is kind of what we expected. A lot of these impacts are very localized. And, you know, you, you might do an article where you, you're going out somewhere, you're talking to someone on the field, but a lot of the coverage of climate change and even adaptation is DC focused, or it's, you know, it's the East Coast focused. And a lot of these smaller news organizations don't necessarily have the budget to hire people like you to really cover that climate. Do you have conversations with um, journalists that maybe are just covering a more regional, local perspective? And do you feel like some really good coverage is missing just because it's more of the national news outfits that have the budgets to actually even cover this issue? I think the most significant problem is that in the last generation, American journalism has been hollowed out by the internet and the advertiser supported model that supported often multiple newspapers in every community in the United States broke. So all those, you know, not all of them, obviously, but just catastrophic amount of newspapers went away, a catastrophic amount of jobs were lost. And so just the United States, which is where I'm based, just does not have boots on the ground to write about anything. And particularly acute with public health situations like you know climate change and the pandemic. Uh, so the primary problem there is much larger even than climate change. Now, that's to say we've also seen some just phenomenal and phenomenally creative efforts to keep journalism going. And like, 
I mean, the amount of people entering the workforce, the amount of young journalists who are now devoted to this topic and telling their communities about it, you know, is also phenomenal. So we just need to find a way to more systematically, you know, match up the incredible need for for local news with the incredible talent pool that already exists, you know, to cover it. All right, let's talk about some more of the areas that you've covered. And this is very interesting to me. I've done it in a few episodes. And you, you look at climate modeling or big data and climate change, and a lot of startups are coming into the space. Could you just tell us a little bit how you even got interested in this subject, how it kind of came across your plate, and then even covering it must be a challenge. It is, but it's new and it's interesting. And I think the the reason I'm interested in it just falls out of like what climate change is. You're like, whether is the original big data topic. And, you know, since the middle or the third quarter of the 19th century, you know, we have daily, if not hourly, temperature and precipitation records for almost the whole world. Fast forward 14 decades, and the repository of global weather information is phenomenal. And that's what allowed climate change to be discovered. Climate change is Climate is defined at its most mundane level as, as an average of weather in an area. So it's always, climate has always been the original big data topic. What is super interesting that's only happening now because we have very fast computers, we have satellites, we have AI and machine learning. For the first time since the first calculations on temperature and carbon dioxide were conducted in the 1890s. Climate science is leaving the government and universities who nurtured it because now businesses can get involved. The tools of climate science are now sufficiently accessible and distributed that people can make a business providing climate services, whether it's projection or past data or you know some kind of industry-specific analysis that helps uh, professionals in one or another sector. So there's just been this this real mushrooming of new business models and PhD scientists entering the the private sector because they finally have tools to be able to help people through business models rather than through peer reviewed journals. What's your sense of and, and I've talked to some of these climate modeling groups that they're looking for business now. They're startups and they're look they're for profit and local governments or even state governments are potential clients for them and. It seems that sometimes the product is just too sophisticated for the end users to understand what's going on there. And that could lead to all sorts of, I mean, how do you even ground truth what they're doing? And again, that's a bigger issue. Like, well, we're here to help you project out 25 years. There's not a lot of, uh, I guess, proper regulation associated with an industry where you're helping someone map out 25 years and your local the planner, this is, they're responsible working with this climate modeling startup, and they really don't have the technical background to even understand what's under the hood. What are you seeing out there in, in regards to clients and end users on these very sophisticated tools? I'm seeing a lot of startups who are offering services that, you know, as you indicated, you know, maybe it's very hard. It's very hard to understand what's in the box. And, you know, science is foundationally a group activity predicated on transparency and openness. And so as recently talked to Kelly Harid at Liberty Mutual, who I know has been on the show, she said, she put it very succinctly, climate science is in an awkward teenage phase. And the reason for that is the standard openness and transparency that are central to the scientific enterprise is now uh, coming into contact with the commercial sector which thrives on proprietary expertise, you know, and sometimes or often proprietary data. And so there's just this very live, very interesting negotiation going on between these two sectors. And it's still early days. You know, there's a lot of companies with a lot of great ideas, with a lot of backing who are trying to, you know, find ways to, to help people. But it's not as easy as, oh, well, here's a new peer-reviewed paper. Let me ask them for their data and rerun it in my model. You know, so it's just that's what makes it such a lively and interesting space. It's just there's so much potential, but there's also so much potential for, you know, for, as you say, for unvetted quasi-science projects to be sold to people who just are looking for help. And that's not to, yeah, full stop. 
Yeah. And again, I don't know everything about the industry. And so some people might think that there's self-regulation or in the industry itself, but it, it seems, have you talked to anyone within these industries that see the need for government regulation? You, you know, you look, you go back to Upton Sinclair and, you know, with meatpacking it, because that led to government getting involved, regulating it. And are we at a stage now where it needs to be regulated before too many local governments just lock in adaptation practices that could be really bad over the next 20, 30 years because self-regulation, you know, it, it might actually need government coming in. And you think of the insurance industry, even though there's plenty of shady insurance companies, there is still some minimal level of state and federal insurance regulation. I think the nature of the enterprise makes that kind of direct intervention in what are at this point, I would characterize as startup businesses and in some cases, legacy mature businesses that, that do catastrophic risk. Government is involved, but not, not in that sort of direct regulatory way because everybody's just trying to figure it out. So like you see, there are conferences where startups mingle with university scientists and, and government officials just trying to like figure out how, you know, how they're all going to do this, how private sector companies are going to protect their special sauce and how you know, the government is going to protect life and limb. And so there's real debate. You know, there's real debate. These are hard questions over like how much climate data should be free because the government is in the business of protecting lives and property. You know, like what is the responsibility of the government to make sure that the climate information is free and clear and accessible to everybody who needs it? because everybody needs it. There's a neat group out of uh, Massachusetts called Probable Futures that just has done a neat job putting together a, a website of, of graphics and data so that so people can just see what the projections look like. And they're not selling it. It's a nonprofit, you know, but there's also businesses who feel like, you know, we have expertise and we can bring some value added here, you know, beyond the research models uh, and it's just, you know, again, it's like I like I said at the beginning, it's like I just kind of I can't wait to see what happens next. And like and whether climate information should be free or how much of it should be free and how much of it should be bought and sold is just a very live question. It's very early days. And it's just not like weather where, you know, right or wrong, like the government has certain prescribed research and publication activities around weather and weather data. And there are now decades old you know, business models that take that government produced data and, you know, and provide weather services to people and businesses. Some kind of evolution like that will occur and is occurring in climate change. We just don't really know what it looks like yet. You know, I had one of the people from Climate Check. It's like a real estate. I don't know if you've heard of them, but they, they you can plug in. And they'll tell you what the future scenarios are and just had them on to talk about them because it, it is one of these groups using climate data. And after the episode came out, and I wasn't endorsing or anything, but it's just these are some of the new tools that are that are out there. Someone told me who, who knew me, contacted me, and they used it. And they this was a really unique kind of thing. They were looking at putting eggs for pregnancy, just um, fertilized eggs in a long, one of these long-term storage things. And they were looking at a place in Florida, but then they plugged in the address to this using this climate check and it just really gave a bad scenario for it. So they ultimately decided to go somewhere much more inland. So I thought that was fascinating. Like here's a consumer decision being driven by one of these climate modeling groups. And I don't know if for better or for worse, that was the right idea, but those things you can't even expect are going to start popping up on how these tools are used. Absolutely. And I mean, an interesting question is, what's the difference between looking at any tool in particular and reading the IPCC reports and looking at a map and saying, oh, well, this region is facing some risk, so I'm going to go somewhere else. You know, I don't know the answer to that. You know, without commenting on any particular initiative or company, how much value is there in knowing specifically or seeing a map with regional risks versus seeing a map with regional risks with your house pinpointed on it. These are the kinds of things that I'm curious about and then I try to talk to people about every week. And I guess part of two is, I mean, they're not charging anything at the moment. They do for bigger clients, but like the IPCC, when you can, you can go find all that information free, but if this organization charges you X amount, you all of a sudden it's, you, it's a consumer product relationship that you didn't necessarily have with the IPCC, even though you're kind of using the information for the same reason. So I guess more responsibility in that sense, I would hope at least. Yeah. You're seeing government 
you know, particularly emergency managers engage with scientists and companies. Uh, and you talked about cities too. I feel like I didn't finish my the answer about like is it going to be regulated? You know, it's regulation is one kind of government interaction, and there's other kinds. And we're seeing non regulatory measures being tested out now, partnerships and and so forth. Again, because it's all so new, nobody seems to be rushing to the hit the regulation button before the space is even settled. So there are a lot of climate journalists in outlets now, but that increase in quantity doesn't necessarily mean increase in quality. There's more climate clickbait now more than ever. What steps do you guys take to verify the quality of the science that you're reporting on? And I guess even your peers on this and, you know, for instance, low quality science published in predatory journals finds its ways into the news cycle. How do you guys manage that quality control? Science itself and journalism, too, has spam filters and peer review is a powerful tool. It's not foolproof by any measure, but every step of the chain, there are more eyes on whatever the study is. And so when we see embargoed studies, you know, we're, we're looking to see what's interesting, what really moves the conversation forward, what is in dispute, and because it's so in dispute, is deserving of public attention. Generally, the way science journalism works is journals make, many journals make their studies available to media before they're published. That allows journalists to take the studies, ingest them, and importantly, share them with independent scientists who are not involved in the study. So in addition to peer review, you know, we're doing our own sort of like backseat peer review to really make sure we understand the quality of a paper, what the criticisms are, whether we should really be spending time on it or not, and where it fits in the big picture. And then all conversations are open. Uh, you know, every article we do is just a part of a, a larger conversation. So if another study comes out that, you know, invalidates a previous one, you know, we write about it. So science is self-correcting and journalism has similar qualities in that, you know, we do our best to be self-correcting as well. Do you find, and I, and I have no doubt just from the articles that you write, you want to get the best science possible. But do you, when you put an article out, do you hear from scientists that are, well, you got this wrong. Does that happen? You know, I mean, knock on wood, like anytime you publish a story, like I've been in journalism, you know, a long time now. And like, anytime you hit the button on a story, like there's never less anxiety about what may have gone wrong. And, you know, we spend enough time obsessing over the big things that, you know, hopefully we never get the or rarely get the big things wrong. Being afraid of making an indefensible mistake is present every day. And, you know, we're constantly in conversation with people we're writing about, with people who work with people we're writing about. We're in conversation with everybody. That's like the whole point of our work. You know, you can see how we do because we make a public correction if we ever get anything wrong. You know, knock on wood, you know, you're only as good as your last article. But, you know, hopefully we don't do too many of those because we stay close enough to, you know, what we're told by multiple sources with independent verification. You know, there is a lot of obviously more noise out in just civic life than there ever has been. And I mean, one thing you just... Like primary sources of climate information have become pretty far removed from the way, you know, many politicians talk about climate change. And, you know, so a lot of criticism come across as just polemics. I mean, a lot of criticism I hear it just sounds like people haven't read the story, you know, or if they read the story, you know, they didn't click to, to see the, the context of the review. I encourage, you know, really aggressively, I encourage people to reach out and talk about these things, we basically live in terror of getting things wrong and leave it at that. Well, I'm sure the challenge too is like, okay, you got a story, you got to get it turned around within a week. Whereas a lot of scientists, they work under that model. Okay, I've spent six months working on this research and I'm going to spend another six months running it through the journal process. And so you just have a different time frames that you're having to factor in. So I certainly can appreciate that. Yes and no, like we're, you know, we're constantly hyper aware of where our sources are from and how confident we are in them. And so mm -hmm. if we're not confident about something, it doesn't go in the story. I don't even know how many dozens of times like I've read a story before it's published. 
And like, if I could actually take another minute on this, I'm a real proponent of just fact checking. You know, I when I was starting out, I learned at Time Inc. magazines how to fact check. And like, you know, when you finished writing a story and it's been edited, you sit down with it and you highlight the whole thing and you go word by word, character by character, looking at your sources and crossing out words or characters as you see that you have at least two sources for each one. You know, so like even a, like a 400 word article is really painstakingly looked at word by word by multiple people, possibly dozens of times to check it against sourcing. And again, that's like, we're not perfect. And we're sometimes we're not even good, but we try hard with the tools the profession has developed over the decades. Hopefully we do okay. All right. So this next question I could be getting myself into trouble with, but it's just something that I'm always interested in broader climate narratives and the media plays a big role in that of, okay, what, what does the public really think about climate change? Who are the spokespeople associated with climate change for better, or for worse? And I look at the phenomenon of, you know, Greta Thunberg and she came up, you know, it was just a really interesting story. It, she was, she's a young woman now, but she started off, you know, as a child when she really rose to fame. She's out there saying a lot of things that I agree with, but I guess my frustration is that the media, especially, especially environmental news shops, she's now a kind of a de facto spokesperson, you know, when there's like COP27, when there's some big environmental climate related event. They're sticking a microphone in front of her. And to be honest, that's not who I want to be asked questions. And I wonder if someone who's at a major news organization, you know, some of these groups, they like have a Greta beat reporter. You're like, what does she say about this? And I, I actually think it might be hurting the climate narrative in the long run. Even though she's saying a lot, she's inspiring a lot of young people. D does that come up in regards to like, who are these spokespeople that you guys are trying to get quotes from? I've never interviewed her. Uh, I don't know that anybody on our staff has. I mean, I'd, okay. I'd have to do a search and see. I think that the dynamic is not limited to to climate change by any means. I mean, it, it's so endemic to you know to just fast journalism that, of course, it's going to happen in climate change because it you know it originated elsewhere. There was a really poignant Twitter stream yesterday, and I regret that I, I don't have it handy. It was by a student journalist in Michigan who just very maturely and with great sensitivity to the survivors of the shooting there last week, just took the media to task for their really crass, really insensitive ways of approaching witnesses and and survivors on campus. And that same approach, I think, is the approach that, you know, that we take here. And I think that tweet thread, I think anybody you have in mind who's like run to interview Greta without having enough background of what climate change actually is, uh, you know, they should see that tweet thread. You know, we try here to be interesting and timely. And I think we don't do a lot of that here because we're just we're trying to be we're trying not to do the same things that everybody else does. I, I think that all media places, general interest media places with large distribution, again, like we're incentivized to put the new in news, right? And trying to get in touch with the White House is is like one thing. Everybody's got to do that because there's a structural reason for that. But sort of climate celebrity journalism is, you know, it, I agree with the premise of the question that it's not helpful. Yeah. And again, not you listen to what she has to say. I'm just like, wow, it's, just, it's very inspiring, but it's more of like she's put front and center. And I think of, and I've had this conversation with friends because I'm trying to get my head around it and something like terrorism, you're not going to go find a child that has been impacted by terrorism and they're going to become a primary policy spokesman around the issue or pandemics or anything like that. And I just feel like it takes away some of the urgency around climate change. And that's my opinion. It's just, it's, yeah, I, no, I, I, I think that, I mean, the, probably the larger point here to emphasize is that conventional news media and television and God knows social media are highly, highly incentivized to promote extreme views and controversy. And like, again, I don't know, leading media organizations, and I hope we're included on that, I think don't do that. You know, we try to be more thoughtful and we try not to do that. But, you know, we're living in this completely dysfunctional environment where social media companies are often financially rewarded for promoting extreme views in whatever form. I mean, I will say that 
you know, Greta, her public statements, like, I believe that she's read the IPCC reports to the extent that any human being has ever read uh, documents that large. You know, she seems at the core of her public pronouncements, for the most part, you know, is somebody who's basically climate literate. And, right. um, you know, saying that is different from evaluating her opinions or the presentation of them. But that, I mean, that's how that's as far as I'll go on, you know, talking about her, that whole phenomenon is, you know, what I listen for is, is has this person sat down with peer reviewed literature before? You know, I think she, to some extent, has checked that box and I can't comment, uh, don't want to comment on uh, <laughs> right. you know, her whole, the whole celebrity that's grown up around her. Yeah, and, and I don't knock her at all from t- taking advantage of the sense that she wants to educate people. She wants to be, a st- but I'm just talking more about the media coverage of her and how they yeah. approach it. And then the broader, the world or America, how they're interpreting who spokespeople are, how, who's in kind of leading these climate issues. And I don't think it's a positive development yeah. beyond her inspiring young people, but that's yeah. its own subset. So. I mean, personally, the reason I'm a writer to some extent is like, I like things to be a little bit slower. You know, if something happens, I'd like to talk to other people about it. I'd like to read about it. And like, so I'm going to lose approximately 100% of races of of speed. But again, we'd like to process things. and, And so hopefully we don't do the kind of things that piss you off. And for my listeners, a note to you that I'll probably get some slack for this. And maybe Greta's really inspiring to you. And my average listener is probably very well-connected in the climate space and not necessarily representative to the general public. And so I get it. Appreciate you going through that question. I, I know I'm probably going to get some <laughs> feedback on that one. We talked a little bit earlier and thinking about your team too, but the Washington Post, I read that every day. I used to live in DC and I still read it every day here in, in Tucson. And they have really ramped up their climate reporting. And it sounds like you have a significant team there. I don't know if you followed them at all or how you could relate it. I think it's fantastic and they're really giving a commitment. But to me, it's one of those things where you kind of roll your eyes and like, all right, in two years, or we're going to hear about budget cuts and staff cuts and the climate team's the first thing to happen. What's your sense of why they're really in, in your, your own team there escalating around this, not escalating, that's not a very good word, but just devoting the resources and, and the riders to this topic. And do you think it's going to stick? Yes, I think it will stick. They do a phenomenal work, phenomenal work. There's a number at this point of large organizations that have really invested in in climate reporting. I mean, I just go back to the basics, roll your eyes or whatever you want. Think of like your ancestors, whoever you are, wherever you came from, like before there was air conditioning and refrigeration, like where did your ancestors come from, right? And like, what are the foods that were handed down? And what were the kinds of dress that were handed down? And food and dress, the primary inputs to like any human culture are foundationally dictated by climate. With the climate changing, the very fundamental organizations of societies, and it's still like, I've been doing this for more than 20 years, it still feels ridiculous to say that. But like, where our cities are and where the shorelines are and where you can grow corn and where you can send kids to summer camp. All of these customs that we have that we take for granted because the climate has never changed before, we now have to take all of those things into account. The foundations of global modern societies, and again, it sounds ridiculous to me still to say this, are being eroded. So the fact that organizations like ours, Washington Post, or or any of the other big players, you know, the fact that we have 20 or 30 people working on this is like, again, modern global human societies were evolved over the last 12,000 years during a period of really anomalous climate stability. From that perspective, it doesn't seem like 20 or 30 people is that much. And, you know, media interest can be fickle and it is cyclical. And around the time Barack Obama was elected, there was a media investment in climate change stuff and it, and it lasted a few years. But like right now, like people are dying every year because of climate change. People are moving. Communities are moving every year because of climate change. 
you know, and th this is just the bad stuff, you know, like agriculture is becoming harder in some places because of climate change. Like one thing we haven't talked about, which is possibly the most important thing is like business is suddenly on it. We have all, not only do we have all the tools we need to fix the problem, like we know where we need them and we know what kind of jobs and what kind of skills we need. And like the money is starting to flow. And so like the rate of fixes coming on board is breathtakingly phenomenal. Like we need a million miracles with climate change. And like just over the last five years, we got like a thousand of them, you know? We're just not necessarily trained to like be able to on a daily basis to handle the scale of this. But once you start to think about it, you can start to marry, you know, your individual decisions, your your business's decisions, you know, to this like mind bogglingly global thing. And I think like that's where we are. So like, is the media covering it more? Yeah. And like, there's so much good work at this point. You've like hit the button and I'm just like running. So I'll, I'll <laughs> breathe for a second. But, you know, like one thing we always ask people is like, what are we doing wrong? Like we talk to scientists, like, what are we doing wrong? What are we covering right? What are we covering enough of? You know, and I was talking to somebody last week and, you know, and he was just said, I'm not worried about you guys. So that was a relief. But uh, yeah. the overall point is there is work to do. Let's do it because we have all the tools we need. I do presentations here and there. And one of my themes is I talk, I'd say adaptation, the greatest story never told. And I try to make the point that, I mean, I honestly feel humanity adapting to climate change will be the biggest thing we ever do. And I, I don't want to diminish war, world wars and such like that. But just as you described with Pakistan earlier, just, we're just ramping that up on scale. It's a big deal. And we still, I don't think, elevated the narratives that could, should be developing around it. And that's, I keep hammering that point home whenever I can, just because this is a big story. <laughs> I don't think yeah. a big story story for 100 years, 200 years. So this is how we live now. And, you know, like to me, one of the fundamental questions of adaptation is what are you adapting to? Like, are you going to adapt to 2025 or 2035 or 2070? Like the, the ball is in motion and everything requires a lot of thought. Well, we want to keep it using the word adapt. We don't want to have to pivot to use the word survive because that's that's much different behavior. So I'm hoping it doesn't go that direction. Climate journalism, and this was a big perk. For, this was incredible news. Someone, a friend told me he was reading the New York Times uh, about a month ago, the Sunday Times and the paper edition, and they were giving some resources around California and all the flooding, the atmospheric river. And they actually had a nice little blurb about uh, the America Adapt podcast I did focused on California. So I, in the New York Times, of course, I pinched myself. It was wonderful, but they referred to I mean, me as a not climate. Bloomberg. Right, it's not Bloomberg. All right. I'm still waiting for that. Listen, I'll, I'll be, give me that Bloomberg plug. I'll be excited about that. But my point is that in the little, I mean, it's a little blur, but it's, they refer to me as Doug Parsons, climate journalist. And I don't know how they found it. I, I think I probably have some listeners there. I think maybe early on, I loosely and probably irresponsibly, oh, climate journalism, but I never say that anymore. And when I was sort of promoting that, I got in there, I'm like, I refer to myself as a climate podcaster, not a climate journalist. I think journalism, there's all sorts of things. You go to school, there's ethics involved. I'd like to think I do a relatively good job. And you and I had chatted about this before in our previous conversation, just from the educational aspect of all the things that you do. And I like to think, you know, I'm a climate educator, but by no means do I think I'm a climate journalist. I don't think people should just loosely identify themselves as journalists, but it's just more of your thoughts too about your own role and responsibilities, just being an educator. There's a lot of kinds of journalism. There's investigative journalism and data journalism and, and explainer journalism, which is something that's really been expanded by the, the web. Everything's been expanded by the web. Investigations and data and explainer journalism. I've always found it really important to try to build like basics into reporting and into projects I take on. Like, not because I'm like a big science guy. I mean, like I cover science, so, you know, I can fake it. But like, I never studied science at school. Like I became a science journalist when I was already out and about just because I was like, what, what is this? I, why don't I understand this? It just, I never studied. One thing that's always motivated me is this Carl Sagan quote from his book, Demon Haunted World. He just puts it so succinctly. He said, we've arranged a global civilization in which most crucial elements profoundly depend on science and technology. We have also arranged things so that almost no one understands science and technology. 
This is a prescription for disaster. We might get away with it for a little while, but sooner or later, this combustible mixture of ignorance and power is going to blow up in our faces. And so like, I have that taped to my wall above my desk and try to execute you know, projects that, you know, in a drop of the bucket way, you know, maybe help, you know, I wrote a book about what carbon is, you know, I, I don't know, I hoped it helped a little bit, you know, we did for since 2015, we've had a, um, you know, a real time live estimate of the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. You know, like, I, I hope it helps a little bit, you know, like, I, I, journalism, again, is a lot of things. And it, it can be a sort of soup to nuts, service of basic things that we need to know, but we just, I'm sorry, we forgot because they don't come up much down to the things that the president said and the latest data release from the International Energy Agency. There is a big tent called journalism. And if you're up here interviewing practitioners every week and getting the word out, then I'm sorry to break it to you, but you're a journalist. Okay. All right. I appreciate that. All right. Last question I ask all my guests. If you could recommend one person to come on this podcast, who would it be? Have you had Christy Eby on? Oh, she's University of Washington, right? Yeah. You know, I have not. I have chatted with her, but we didn't actually do a recording. So what, why, why is that your recommendation? Climate change is a public health issue. And uh, she is really one of the practitioners who has done a great job talking about and, and researching climate change as a threat to human health, you know, particularly for the elderly, the infirm, uh, you know, historically disadvantaged communities, like the heat is here, it's not even coming anymore. And she does a really eloquent job bringing her expertise to bear on on what communities can and should do. I think this isn't a, a person, but like California is a world of climate change into itself between wildfires and heat and drought and and flooding and you know the fact that it's the fifth largest economy in the world there is no bigger microcosm than california and they're just so far ahead on solutions too like i would you know there's any of 100 people that you could have on but like the center of a lot of both risk and progress is is in california yeah i seem to constantly have a lot of california but even professors but if you're digging around my archive i that was the one the new york times was plugging i did a three part series california daps and i traveled up and down the state just talking to water experts wildfire experts and so yeah that we, that was a very eye opening get kind of california right at the center of it so and and christy will be just to, on a note when i called her she we didn't record i was just getting her feedback cuz there's this effort to try to name heat waves that I'm not sure if it's gone anywhere recently, but it, it, from my, my understanding, it's actually kind of a dumb idea. And I was just chatting with her because you know she's in the thick of a lot of those things. And I don't want to put words in her mouth if that's what she said, but it was I was just doing some background, and she just absolutely understood the whole public health aspect of extreme heat. So that was my interaction with her. Eric, always a treat to talk to journalists. If you're working on some big story, hopefully I can get you back on and we can talk about these things because like you said, climate change isn't going away. And I do love just talking about these issues in a, in a much different way than I'm talking with like, let's say a scientist. So I appreciate the work that you're doing and thanks for coming on the podcast. Thanks for having me. It was a lot of fun to chat. Okay, adapters, that is a wrap. Thanks to Eric for joining the podcast. That's a first two back-to-back Eric episodes. Dr. Eric Chu of UC Davis joined me in my last episode. What a treat covering Eric, a thoughtful and ethical journalist who's doing critical work covering climate change. I love talking to journalists. As we discussed, media coverage of climate change has been getting better over the years, and we've come a long way from the days when newspapers used to give climate skeptics equal time. However, there's still a lot of fake news out there, and we need more writers like Eric who are committed to doing their due diligence with stories and understanding how science should be integrated into their work. Climate journalists have a key role to play in shaping public opinion and policy around this critical issue, and we need them now more than ever. As someone who's been reading newspapers for a long time, I know that their coverage can go through highs and lows. However, I'm hopeful that their climate coverage only keeps expanding as climate journalists help set larger narratives and provide important context for this complex issue. Climate change still has a major identity crisis, but it's obviously a huge issue that we need to confront head on. So to all those young journalism students out there, I encourage you to get into the climate change space. We need your fresh perspective and your passion to help shed light on this issue and to shape the public discourse around it. We're counting on you to tell this massive story. It's not going away anytime soon. 
Thanks again, Eric. Okay. I'm always hearing from listeners that they have started listening to the podcast in the last few months or in the last year. And that means they've missed out on a bountiful archive if they haven't poked around at previous episodes. So I'm going to dig around in the vault when I can and highlight two previous episodes in case you need some recommendations. All right. In episode 121, Hazard Mitigation Meets Climate Adaptation, I'm joined by Dr. Andrew Rumbach, Senior Fellow at Urban Institute. And he was actually at Texas A&M when he did this interview. We discussed the similarities and differences between the two fields. And Andrew shared research looking at historic resource vulnerabilities to climate change. And we learned the unique role mobile homes play in determining a community's overall resistance to climate and weather threats. Also check out episode 159, the Federal Reserve Bank and climate-related risks. I was joined by Dr. Elizabeth Matusi of the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco. Lizzie's latest research unpacked the ways low and moderate income communities are vulnerable to climate risk. You'll learn the role of housing and security in communities' climate vulnerabilities. Her research also uncovers awareness levels among organizations dealing with climate risk and what impacts they perceive are affecting their community members. It's important research with many implications for on-the-ground practitioners. Definitely check out those two in the archive. The links to those are in my show notes. All right. Are you looking for an innovative way to share your climate adaptation story with the world? Do you feel like your webinars and white papers are not getting the traction you had hoped for? Then consider sponsoring a whole episode of America Adapts. By sponsoring an episode, you'll have the chance to share your adaptation story with climate professionals from all over the globe. And the best part? you get to work with me personally to identify the experts that represent the amazing work you're doing. Some of my previous partners include Battelle, NRDC, University of Pennsylvania at Wharton, World Wildlife Fund, UCLA, Harvard, and various corporate clients. By sponsoring a podcast, you'll have the opportunity to share your story with my listeners who represent some of the most influential people in the adaptation space. And unlike a white paper or conference presentation, podcasts have a long shelf life and will continue to reach new audiences long after the initial release. Don't miss out on this chance to get your message out to the world. Budget in a podcast for your next communication strategy and see the impact it has on your outreach efforts. Okay. Do you want to inspire your audience with real-life stories of climate adaptation? Look no further. I'm available to speak at your public or corporate event and share my experiences in this exciting field. I've given many keynote presentations, and I'll weave together stories from the America Adapts podcast and my own experiences to motivate and inspire your audience. Don't miss out on this opportunity to learn about climate adaptation in a fun and informative way. To book me as a speaker, simply visit americadapts.org and get in touch. And finally, as a host of American Apps, I love to connect with my listeners and hear your thoughts on the show. Whether you're just saying hello or have an idea for guests, I'd like to hear from you. I'm all ears. Your feedback helps me improve the show and sometimes even leads to exciting new opportunities. So don't be shy. Drop me a line at americadapts at gmail.com. Let's chat. Okay, adapters, keep up the great work. I'll see you next time.